Thank you very much, Christophe. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Kerstin, for the uh, invitation and the kind uh, introduction. Um, the title of my lecture is, is two parts, so Hope Has Returned, and the first decade, Hope Has Returned, is a, an, um, a sentence by Geert Beekaert, uh, Kerstin already mentioned him, and the first decade is the uh, title of an exhibition that was organized in uh, 1989 in the spring. Uh, it was the first major retrospective exhibition in the Netherlands of the work of OMA and Rem Koolhaas, organized in, as you can see, Museum Boymans van Beuningen. And uh, curiously enough, received as a sort of reckoning with uh, Koolhaas' home country. This is an, um, a, a review from uh, the major uh, Dutch newspaper at the time, and the title says, Rem Koolhaas shows 10 years of disappointment. So uh, it was received, but it was certainly also intentioned as a, as a sort of uh, reckoning with uh, the fact that uh, OMA had not been able to build uh, a lot of uh, things or execute a lot of designs in, uh, in the Netherlands. Actually, only a third of the 42 projects OMA made between 1978 and 1989 got executed. And at the opening night of the exhibition, Koolhaas said to uh, another Dutch newspaper, I believe that the Netherlands would have been a better country if at least a part of our plans were realized. And then he added, I say this rather stoically than righteously. Uh, Rem Colas for several reasons. Um, and together with uh, Veronique Pate, as some of you may know, I am uh, preparing a team issue of the journal Oase on the uh, specifically the production of Colas and OMA during this first decade. So all the projects prior to the uh, first decade in 1998. Uh, the issue by um, <coughs> The issue of OASA will be published in March of next year, and this is the first cover that uh, Karl Martes uh, made. We have uh, two kinds of texts in the issue, project reviews, shorter text discussing one project from this era, and uh, thematic essays, somewhat longer, and discussing one technique or one uh, theme. This is uh, the complete list of the first decade, more or less, because as you will see, in the first decade, there were also pro uh, already projects shown or on, on display that actually date from a later, uh, or that were executed at a later time. Uh, and <clears throat> this is the list we got from the uh, website of OMA, and it is, is, it is as such not complete. So projects that are missing are smaller projects like the Strada Novissima from 1980, or um, this quite remarkable design, an uh, exhibition design for contemporary sculpture in Rotterdam in 1998. Uh, in bold, you see the projects that were uh, built or executed. Underlined, you have the projects, just well, for, uh, to give an overview, that are being discussed in the issue of OASA, and highlighted in green are five projects that I will uh, discuss uh, today. And the way that I uh, will look at these five projects is by um, somewhat examining their critical or polemical nature. Uh, I think that especially during the 80s, uh, almost every OMA design was made in reaction to something else. So you could, most of the time it was architecture, but sometimes it was also a sort of opposition against the culture of the time or the politics. So you could say that the method in, uh, in this first decade of Colas was uh, essentially dialectic. He, also tried, he always tried to oppose the dominant discourse or the dominant practice at a certain moment uh, in history. Um, my interpretation, or um, well, to put it differently, I also, uh, when looking at the, a decade that is already like 30 years behind us, uh, I think it is useful to also, certainly useful to also look at the critical reception of um, the, um, the, the, the production of OMA uh, in this period. Um, and as Kerstin already hinted uh, at, I think that uh, the, the uh, Dutch, the, the, the reception in the Dutch speaking world was, well, just to put it simple, uh, quite interesting during the 80s. Because uh, 
there is something about the work in this period that is specifically polemical towards uh, Dutch or uh, Western European uh, architecture uh, in general. Um, <clears throat> that does, uh, well, it's not, uh, it, that doesn't mean that Colas was uh, particularly fond of uh, the, the Dutch uh, or the Netherlands at the time. For example, he said uh, in an interview in 1985 that uh, nothing he did had any effect uh, in uh, the Netherlands and that he had a much richer relationship with his American, English and uh, French colleagues. Um, but it is undeniably so that OMA made a lot of projects during the 80s for Dutch and European cities and that there was a lot of uh, critical and uh, insightful writing uh, on um, uh, their production. Um, for example, I have one cover of a, a sort of the issue that more or less introduced, uh, or it was actually the first team issue on the work of OMA in the Dutch-speaking world from the magazine Wone TABK. This magazine is later turned into Archis and is now volume. Uh, and is as such somewhat um, uh, curated by uh, AMO as well. And it is exactly in this um, uh, team issue of uh, Wone Tiabika that was the text, one of the first large texts on, uh, or essays on uh, the production of OMA, 1982 by Geert Bekaert, who is at the picture, at, uh, or shown at the picture on the right, with the last sentence, hope has returned. Now, uh, I will, shortly try to explain why uh, Bekart found it necessary to sort of um, uh, welcome uh, Kohlhaas in, uh, in the Netherlands and then simply in a, such an enthusiastic fashion. And indeed his text can be read as a sort of homecoming address uh, to Kohlhaas and it plots the, or Bekart plots the historical path to his designs and writings contending that he has gone abroad, as you all know, to Manhattan to learn from New York, to write delirious New York, to develop a sort of method to create late 20th century metropolitan architecture. But then, Bekart wrote in his text, uh, uh, Kohlhaas realized that the method he developed um, in uh, New York proved totally impotent in the metropolitan area and in America itself. Um, one can understand it because a retroactive manifesto is somewhat useless in the locations where the mechanisms it describes take place of themselves. So what, uh, what Colas needed, at least in the interpretation of Bekart, is a sort of uh, something against which this strategy, uh, the, the um, sort of uh, metropolitan architecture of New York, could uh, react and which could serve as a, a polemical stimulus. Colas himself, Bekart wrote, went on to fill this gap in the arena of the metropolis. He had already shot his last bolt. Supporters of his retroactive manifesto did not stand a chance as designers in New York. He was forced to retreat to less metropolitan and more provincial areas, such as the Netherlands. And then um, Bekart refers to the story of the pool which you probably all know, I won't uh, explain it in detail, but uh, he sort of adds an, another ending to the, the story of the pool that Colas published in 1976 by stating that this, this boat that went from Russia to New York has now left New York again and is, has come home uh, through Rotterdam um, and found there a home port and then hope has returned. Is the conclusion of this return of uh, the the, the pool of the Russian uh, constructivist. Now, <coughs> I think that the, the question of answering, uh, or the question of, of why um, Colas was identified with uh, hope in the Dutch speaking architecture scene can be answered by uh, looking closer at five um, unbuilt uh, competition designs. Um, the Dutch Parliament uh, in, the, in The Hague in 1978, the City Hall in The Hague, the Netherlands Architecture Institute, an, a quite unknown project for an office building at the airport in Frankfurt, and the Sea Trade Center uh, in uh, Zeebrugge. 
Now, it has, of course, become somewhat of a cliché to, uh, to narrow Kohlhaas' polemical position in the 80s to uh, his crusade against postmodernism. Like, for example, uh, well, this stance against postmodernism was certainly present in the, the facade for the Strada Novissima, as I have shown. But, um, well, as I said, this crusade against postmodernism is somewhat of a cliché in the sense that a much broader analysis uh, is uh, possible. And it was that because uh, Kolas criticized and opposed much um, or almost everything that architecture had come to represent at the time, that he was uh, received as the bringer of hope by uh, certain uh, critics. First design is uh, for the Dutch Parliament extension, 1978, an open competition was organized uh, for the expansion of the Parliament headquarters at the uh, Binnenhof complex in The Hague. This is actually already a picture of the design that uh, got executed. Um, <coughs> uh, it's a design by uh, the Dutch architect Pieter Bruin. And um, the design by OMA had to compete, compete at the time with 110 other entries. Uh, and the jury decided that none of the projects could be selected for a second round and that the complexity of the commission was not met with sufficient craftsmanship. The design by OMA, uh, OMA did got or did or was rewarded with a shared first prize. But then the parliament itself decided to uh, ask three other architects for a new design. And it was this design that then uh, got implemented, uh, but only finished in 1991. So as you can see, uh, the, the addition um, to the existing structure is actually in the middle. You can use the hand here. This part, all the rest is a sort of uh, historical, uh, the historical city center of uh, The Hague. And what uh, this group did was sort of linked the existing buildings and uh, joined them by additions in a somewhat classical, monumental, modernist style, uh, so that a, an almost massive building block um, uh, well, appeared. Now, Many architecture critics had done what they could to call attention to the designs submitted by OMA, and um, there is, Kohlhaas was also given the opportunity to criticize the other proposals. This is um, the, the design by OMA, as you probably know. So this is the, uh, this building is quite visible here, it's this one. So actually, the, uh, this drawing is uh, 45 degrees turned uh, in regards to the previous photograph. Um, what Kola said about uh, their own design was that, uh, in compared to the other entries, the entire uh, Binnenhof uh, was filled with what he called a gigantic concrete pudding. But in their plan, the uh, terrain seemed empty, despite the fact that they occupied the same floor area. Now, uh, the unique nature, certainly if you compare it to the other entries of the OMA design for The Hague, is certainly uh, indisputable. Uh, as the reception uh, shows, there are, it's very contrasting with uh, prevailing notions of how to deal with the historical and multi-layered architecture of the European city uh, at the time. So um, you could say that the design by OMA is, uh, is actually driven by the desire to um, clearly show what is um, an addition to the historical uh, structure and what is not. Um, so three buildings, well, uh, you probably all know the design, but three buildings are uh, assembled along two intersecting axes. You have a long, low building here with meeting rooms and public spaces, a long, narrow building for the politicians, and then an extra smaller building uh, to meet the required floor area. And the three different uh, volumes are connected by means of ramps and so on. Um, there is one very uh, polemical gesture inside of the, or uh, as part of the uh, design, that is that rather than demolition or then uh, demolishing certain parts of the existing uh, structure, OMA proposed the transplantation of one 17th century structure 
to a position in front of the complex. So that's actually this building that is in this picture here and is actually the proposition by OMI is to replace it to uh, here so that they have this area free for uh, their design. So one existing building would have been moved in order to make space for the addition of new infrastructures. Uh, the, the jury, as I said, was intrigued, but um, thought that the, uh, the, 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 well, the design was too harsh and that the environment was destroyed in, um, uh, by the intervention of the architect. But nevertheless, the OMR design was the only proposal that survived. So there came a second competition uh, in 1980 and then several critics re uh, made renewed calls for uh, the OMR proposal to be considered again. Now, um, it was during the uh, second half of the 80s that Colas could somewhat maximally exploit the polemical position of his propositions. And again, the debate was very intense. So the debate here was clearly um, about how to deal with the historical city. Um, while the, the question of the design for the city hall in the same cities, uh, The Hague, was about how to, uh, to sort of design a uh, an representational building for, uh, well, for a democracy. Uh, in a sense. So how could you make uh, a democratic institution visible inside of an, uh, the historical city center uh, of uh, The Hague? Now, uh, again, I begin with the building that was uh, realized. This is uh, the project by uh, Richard Meyer. Um, There were five designs made for the uh, competition, but in the debate that followed, and also the jury, and only had to decide between two uh, projects, that of Meyer and uh, that of Kohlhaas. Um, the design by Richard Meyer, well, you know, you probably know the style of Richard Meyer, sort of white, detailed, late modernist, somewhat Miami Vice-like, uh, architecture with uniform and continuous uh, facades uh, directed at different parts of the city. But then inside of the building, you have one gigantic closed and traditional hall, a sort of atrium of an uh, office building, but actually a street uh, connecting the, um, the entrance and the exit of the building and maintaining as such only very indirect relationships with the, uh, with the rest of the city and with the outside world. Now, the design by OMA was, again, uh, very different. It had a rectangular floor plan uh, consisting of three long parallel uh, segments. And the three parts, also in three colors, as you can see, three parts have different heights, different facades, um, thereby somewhat, well, deliberately sabotaging the, the massive character of the building. So it's a, a gigantic uh, 150,000 square meter uh, uh, building but it doesn't look as such because of the, um, well, the, the, the rectangular floor plan consisting of, of three uh, segments. Uh, it also formed, and this is visible in this, uh, this is a photograph of the model. It also formed a triangular square with the uh, city center or with the spur, the city square, and thus with the uh, dance theater, another project at the time, I think, under construction. So here um, was the intention of, of Colas to sort of, uh, well, sort of design the, 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 this part of the city in its entirety together with uh, um, a small part of the uh, dance theater. Inside of this, um, uh, different, uh, in, inside of the city hall, you had, uh, of course, or inside of the building, you had the different components of the city hall, including the city library, but also including the city library. And all, all these different uh, components were intertwined as much as possible. 
And the model that uh, Cole has used for this project was the Rockefeller Center, designed by Raymond Hood, as you know, in Manhattan. And the design by OM, uh, OMA presented somewhat the same interweaving of different uh, programmatic components, also uh, debouching in the central heart, but also uh, in the rest of the city. Now, in a contribution to the forthcoming issue of OASE, uh, uh, Francesco Marullo has written a text about this project. And in the archives of OMA, of OMA he has found a letter by Peter Eisenman directed. Uh, so Eisenman wrote a letter to the jury um, that was to decide which project would be executed. And he wrote in this letter, the project of Ram Colas for the new town hall of The Hague is an important statement uh, about a city and about its architecture. Symbolically, it is not a monument, it is a building in process. And this is the only appropriate symbolism for a major building in a social democracy. It is about today as tomorrow and not about concretizing today as tomorrow's yesterday. It is above all not an authorial building. It does not bear witness to the signature of the architect, but to the idea of the city. Now, of course, um, in regards to this statement by Eisenman, it is, this is not just any idea of the city or any kind of city. And, uh, the city that is represented by this design is modern in the sense that the building, the city hall, is not recognizable as a city hall or as a public monument. It is simply part of the city, just like a library, a shopping center, or a, a skating rink. Now, you could say the same about the design by uh, Meyer, but the difference is that Meyer's building looks just like any other corporate office building. And the project by OMA was on the one hand a completely generic and in a sense uh, infinitely expandable, somewhat almost a factory line of uh, square office meters. But on the other hand, it was all, also, almost, also almost everything else. So a public square, uh, a library, a part of the city, a shopping mall, um, Etc. Now, as I said, the debate was uh, quite intense again, and Colas did everything he could to uh, persuade, often behind the scenes, as many people as possible of the strengths of this design. This is, for example, a fax message from Colas to Geert Beker, thanking him for his contribution to the debate and urging him to uh, continue to sort of defend his uh, proposal. What Colas is referring to is this uh, um, opinion piece in the NRC Handelsblatt, the, well, at, certainly at the time the most important Dutch newspaper, stating that the project by Colas was a chance that could not be missed, and actually using quite similar arguments uh, as those of Eisenman, uh, by, uh, for example, by calling the design an extremely uh, intelligent articulation of possibilities. And then two weeks later, just to, so, just to show how um, certainly at the time the, 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 the conversation about architecture was in the Netherlands, and this is, I think, no longer the case, but in the 80s was in the Netherlands really uh, that the conversation about architecture was a part of, of the public debate. So it was something that was really decided and discussed on, in, in newspapers or uh, on television. Um, so there was another opinion piece by uh, Nick de Boer, a uh, Dutch professor of urbanism teaching at the TU Delft, stressing that the design by Colas did not look like a city hall, but presented a tangle of completely different activities. And then he sort of uh, made a claim for the design by Meyer by stating that Meyer uh, survived uh, the chaos. So this is the title of his uh, opinion piece. <coughs> Then there's another uh, newspaper uh, clipping from the time, uh, just to show that it, it reached the sort of the, the front page that uh, when it was decided that uh, Richard Meyer was allowed to uh, build the city hall. Um, the, the design uh, for the Netherlands Architecture Institute in 1990, 1988 in Rotterdam was probably even more uh, dramatic, or at least the design competition um, was more dramatic. 
because at stake here, you could say, was the identity of Dutch architecture and also the, uh, well, sorry for this low um, density picture. But um, the subject of the competition was the, 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 the role that architecture could or should play in society. So. <coughs> The, um, the, the, the competition brief was simply to uh, design a building, sort of headquarter for um, uh, the Netherlands Architecture Institute, the NIE. At the time, this was still a relatively young institution. It came into being during the 80s as a result of a fusion of three other organizations. And um, uh, the intention was that it would contain a museum for uh, architecture, a cafeteria, a library, a large archive space, offices, and a bookshop. At its location, uh, well, some of you may know this, but uh, was a triangular square here. The Hoboken plan, uh, close to the city center. So the uh, city center of Rotterdam is here. The, the, station is, the train station is in that direction. Uh, and also in front of the oldest museum in Rotterdam, here, uh, Museum Boymans van Beuningen, which was exactly, and I think not coincidentally, the place where uh, uh, the first decade the exhibition was organized three years after the, um, this competition for the NIE. And this is, this is a picture of a model that OMA made and here you can also see their first design for the Kunsthal and in between the NIE and the uh, the Kunsthal is the museum park design made by OMA and uh, Yves Brunier uh, at the end of the 80s. So when they uh, lost the competition for the NIE, they also had to restart the design of the Kunsthal because uh, both buildings were really somewhat uh, interconnected uh, in their conception. Now, why I show this, this is a sort of uh, booklet that was um, published. This is Kohlhaas and this is, uh, well, Jo Koenen, that's the, the, the Dutch architect whose design will eventually be uh, executed. But when this, <coughs> um, this booklet was published uh, accompanying an exhibition uh, in 1988 in the Museum Boymans van Beuningen during the summer of, uh, of that year. Um, and there is an interesting phrase in this uh, uh, catalog because um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the exhibition was organized by the, the, the people who sort of organized the, uh, the competition as well. And they wrote in the introductory text that uh, the lack of a real metropolitan milieu in the Netherlands raises the risk that Kohlhaas buildings will amount to nothing more than the empty, wasted gesture of a provincial prima donna. So that that's, uh, interpretation of OMA's architectural project was diametrically opposed, as I've said, to that of Beekart in his article, because Beekart clearly stated that, uh, that the, the metropolitan architecture of, um, of Kohlhaas could only be useful or interesting Era. Uh, now, Kolas was very furious about uh, this remark. Uh, he gave an interview in 1989, in uh, which he said in this magazine of, uh, well, sort of Vlees and Beton, a Belgian magazine devoted to uh, OMI in Nederland. And uh, Kolas said, isn't it amazing that this quote, so about the empty gesture in the province, should come from the co-organizers of the museum competition? Shameless, unimaginable, the fact that four months after the end of the competition it is formulated in such a way is a provocative demonstration of how openly they had rejected the design. In a civilized country, one would go to trial. Colas, in the same interview, even went so far as to blame his book, so Delirious New York, for the view that OMA's approach could not work in Europe. And he took pains to renounce it in the interview by saying, again explicitly, that he did not want to, or that he did not want to be the one who was going to prove the thesis of uh, Delirious New York.
Now, uh, there certainly was quite a lot of praise for the uh, design that uh, OMA made for the NIE uh, and uh, for this competition. There was again an, uh, an opinion piece in uh, NRC Handelsblatt. Um, and uh, well, to sort of s sort of summarize the design, you could say that uh, much more than um, the other projects of the first decade. This design is a sort of machine for activities, meetings, and confrontations. You have a, a quadrangular heart that houses the private functions. So this one, uh, archives and offices, and a larger triangular roof defining the public spaces around the core. The roof is sloping in the direction of the city, and the uh, uh, entire building is surrounded by glass facades in different grades of uh, opacity. So um, two other critics called it um, in Forum, mag another Dutch magazine, architecture which is, which is open to the many possibilities that the program potentially contains. We only have to imagine the possibilities of the auditorium. When some event has attracted too many people, the dividing curtains can be opened and the auditorium becomes part of the hall. Now the quote I, I just uh, uh, read is uh, from an article appear, appearing in Forum, which was only one decade earlier, the Dutch magazine or the magazine of Dutch structuralists uh, and Team 10. And again, this is uh, showing a sort of shift or a polemical stance towards the uh, architecture of uh, uh, in the Netherlands at the time. So the structuralists at the sort of sort of goodwilled tendency to guide or, um, uh, or to accompany human activities by means of architecture, while in, certainly in the design for the NIE, you had a sort of willingness to let activities uh, define architecture, which is also present in the uh, drawings that were made for the uh, project book showing different scenarios, and they, are, they, are, they even made uh, the exercise of uh, imagining how existing uh, exhibitions of the past could be staged inside of the NIE. Now, um, as I said, a lot of people were in favor of the design by OMA, but uh, it was this design that got executed by uh, Jo Koenen with a very imposing and, well, monumental design. with an extra roof um, on top of the main building and crowning the entire site with a curved uh, gallery that contained the archives, or still contains the archives, uh, which is a sort of, um, well, very representative and very old fashioned way, sort of crown for uh, Dutch architecture. Um, but at the same time, it did not uh, represent the, the, the open um, presence of architecture in the city as the NIE uh, or the design by OMA did. So this was a sort of a platform that was uh, accessible for everyone and that was sort of confronted uh, in an extreme way with uh, uh, the city. Well, this design is clearly a sort of uh, stage uh, for architecture to to close itself in uh, and to um, well, there's no no real confrontation with uh, the the content of the building um, itself. It's a more recent picture, and this is the completely empty colonnade uh, underneath the very long colonnade underneath the uh, archive. So this is this colonnade um, containing the archives. This is actually the uh, building with um, exhibition rooms and these are offices and libraries surrounded by water. And here begins the museum park with uh, further on the um, Kunsthal, and this is the Museum Boymans van Beuning. Now, the next 
the fourth design I want to discuss is from 1989, in the late spring and the uh, summer of 1989, exactly when the exhibition of the first decade was taking place. OMA was, uh, or OMA took part in five different European competitions. So every, more or less every three weeks, a new project needed to, needed to be delivered. Um, and you could say that what happened in uh, the spring of 1989 was that in these five designs, OMA somewhat distanced themselves, themselves from an all too easy modernism. <coughs> You could say that in the first decade, so prior to 1989, Colas had been using somewhat generic, non-monumental language of modernist architecture in order to stage activities in an urban environment uh, as excitingly and openly as possible. Uh, at the end of the 80s, and particularly in 1989, it was time for uh, something else. And the design in which you can locate this uh, change um, is also one of the least known projects by OMA. As far as I know, uh, nobody has written extensively about it, although it is present in uh, SML XL from 1995 in the category medium. Um, but it is, I think, revelating because it shows extreme architectural options that OMA was taking into consideration during the um, spring of 1989. Uh, this is the airport of uh, Frankfurt, so a more recent picture. Uh, and the competition from 1989 had, had as its subjects the construction of a, an office building, a Bureau Centrum Ost, for administrative purposes. And the site was, this was actually the site with these, these buildings were already existing at the time of the competition in 89. So the site was uh, bordered in the north by a motor, large motorway, in the south by the, in 1989, yet to be constructed monorail between the two terminals. And the brief was, existed in using the available space as good as possible without exceeding the permitted height and without sabotaging, uh, as they said it in the brief, an adjusted architectural form. Uh, next to MA, six other offices were invited, four German offices, also Aldo Rossi and Terry Farrell. In uh, June 1989, the first prize was awarded to OMA, but for various, I think, uninteresting reasons, the design uh, would not be executed. Now, in SMLXL, the book from 1985, the design for this office city, uh, again, a very large uh, design of more than uh, 15,000 employers, um, was entitled, so the title of, of the, the, the chapter devoted to this design is Neue Sachlichkeit. And in the publication documenting the competition from 1989, there was a comparison made by OMA or by Colas with Das Neue Frankfurt, which you see here, probably know the more than 12,000 houses that were realized in uh, Frankfurt between 1925 and 1930 under the direction of uh, Ernst May. And indeed, this is one of the spreads from SMLXL. The design for uh, this office building is one of the most homogeneous uh, designs in the history of OMA. It consists of one strip of two and a half kilometers long, eight, flo eight floors high, um, with, this is the model, with one grid of uh, identical windows. And this small strip is wound uh, three times around the existing buildings in white, uh, resulting so in long stretched, here you see a uh, site plan, in long stretched, but nevertheless, still somewhat intimate patios each, each time with a different character. So there were vegetable gardens, little squares, but also uh, pedestrian streets. So here you see again, this is uh, the strip uh, wound uh, around the heart of the uh, existing buildings. And then to avoid uh, circulation through endless corridors, there is a connection made linking north and south over the three rings of the strip. And this piercing marks the spot for the main entrances. Um, 
well, the, these entrances are still invisible in the exterior, but also connect uh, existing buildings with new buildings by means of a, here a large leisure zone with sports facilities uh, and a swimming pool. So it is certainly a design that looks for uh, extremes. On the one hand, it is based on an industrial and very repetitive and almost inhuman logic. But it also creates unique, specific and very, you could say, almost picturesque zones on the scale of a small courtyard. Um, yeah, the ground is also covered with different natural materials, but the facades are uniformly clad in travertine or glass. And the largest exterior facade, this one, so almost 350 meters long, um, on Pilotis, very close to the motorway in the north, um, embodies uh, the, the ambiguity between uh, sort of very harsh and strict industrial character of the building, but also the sort of more human and uh, specific nature uh, of the design. Now, this is a line drawing showing a grid of more than 1,000 identical windows. So at the east side, one floor disappears uh, and the gallery becomes twice as high. But, and this is not visible in this drawing, but it is visible uh, in the drawing from, uh, in, or in the drawings from Azamal Excel. On this long facade, uh, erected in glazed brick, a gradient is applied. So from east to west, I don't know, no, someone else. Um, you can see it on the model. From east to west, um, the color slowly changes from black to white. So this uh, slow but precise metamorphosis in as a Malik Sali is called a dazzle or a dazzle on the autobahn shows I think in a sort of very exemplary fashion how generic the architecture of Huema at this moment in 1989 is or wants to be so you can wonder why is this gradient necessary and why can this facade uh, not be pure and untreated uh, I think in a comparison with uh, the uh, dwellings or the Siedlungen uh, in Frankfurt might give a possible answer. Um, especially, well, there are passages from uh, uh, Tafuri and Dalko writing about these um, uh, projects and uh, calling them metaphorical images of the assembly line itself. Um, so May, like the uh, Ernst May, like the other modernists from the 20s, somewhat believed in the um, uh, generic and unobtrusive urban dwelling architecture that was more or less content in disappearing as boring, or at least not so uh, as a, a boring or at least not so surprising background um, by minimalizing. The, the extraordinary character and the singularity of the architectural object. Um, Tafuri again called this project a victory of the perception of the type over the perception of the unicum. So if you uh, apply this to this design, you can ask the question if this office city would have been experienced as a type or as something unique, as a, a, a unicum. And it is exactly, I think, the dazzle on the facade, no matter how seemingly superficial, that turns this building into a building. So it has a clear start here and a clear ending there. And the reproducibility or the expandability of the building um, as, as a building brick of the city is, is halted by... Um, uh, the gradient, because you can wonder how can this facade continue or here if the black is already completely black, as black as can be. Um, certainly in comparing it with the design for uh, the City Hall in The Hague, which was much more expandable and which, which was much more sort of scheme that could be uh, enlarged uh, infinitely, uh, in this design, OMA sort of tried to keep the, the old-fashioned aura of architecture alive, even, it was, even if it was by uh, 
programmatic. So then I mean the uh, the the patios and the the different treatment of the the interiors, um, but also by by well sort of superficial twists of the um, of the facade. It might also be uh, interesting to compare um, the project by uh, from OMR with that uh, with the one by uh, Rossi made for the competition in Frankfurt. So it is sort of typical, typical colorful, repetitive, seemingly timeless uh, building elements, quite regardless of the context, but. Um, incorporating the uh, existing buildings. And uh, in the text uh, accompanying the design, Rossi wrote that he wanted to deliver a powerful, expressive image with which the inhabitants of Frankfurt could identify themselves, although it should also be immediately recognizable for visitors. So if you um, apply these words to the design by OMA, I think that... Uh, with their design, OMA was not looking for somewhat recognizable architecture, but uh, for the creation of an at the same time ordinary, but also exciting and uh, almost a spectacular um, uh, office building. And this is one of the, the changes that are present in 1989 uh, in the production of OMA. Uh, that after this, uh, the era of the Merveille began. For uh, I, re I refer, of course, to the retrospective book by Roberto Gargiani from 2008. Um, after this, uh, there is a sort of tendency in the production of OMA to create unique, new, and marvelous objects. Um, and that was, I think, not present in the, the production of the first decade as such. Now, to conclude and to show one of those very marvelous or one of the most marvelous uh, designs of OMA also produced during the spring of 1989, so during this period when they were uh, participating in uh, five or six competitions at the same time. To conclude, I will shortly uh, consider the design for the Sea Trade Center. Competition organized uh, Sea Trade Center in Zeebrugge in Belgium. Competition organized by the ferry company, so the the company that uh, enabled you, well, it probably still exists, but enables you to uh, take a boat and uh, go from Belgium to the UK. Uh, and this um, uh, ferry company knew that there were plans to, uh, or they were already. Uh, building a tunnel and a railway link. So they decided something drastic was needed to maintain the attraction of uh, crossing the channel from Europe to the UK by boat, which was, well, you, you probably, it's probably hard to imagine, but uh, during the 80s, this was, I think, one of the most uh, um, well, popular ways of, uh, of going to the UK from, uh, from, in, from the continent. Now, the, uh, the entire uh, competition as such, uh, or the project for Zeebrugge, was in this sense a sort of glorification of the possibilities, also the commercial possibilities of public transport. And this is, I think, if I'm correct, this was the location for the uh, Sea Trade Terminal. So actually the, the, the last uh, point before, uh, one of the last points of uh, Europe. This is the design uh, by OMA um, that sort of, uh, well, you can summarize the design by, by uh, saying that it sort of uh, maximizes all the different uh, activities that could take place inside of this, um, uh, inside of uh, an, an, um, a similar uh, sea trade center. So, you have uh, a traffic of cars, um, but also traffic of the um, uh, the boats, uh, parking lots, trains, and these things do not become not only become part of the event, but 
their own charm is somewhat uh, well granted to sort of specific presence. Um, so this is a, a site plan. You have, this would actually be the the building. This is the uh, well, parking lots leading up to the building. These are the um, Well, here you can see quite well how all the activities in, inside and outside of the building were uh, sort of entangled as intensely as possible. And y you have here a sort of European uh, version of the culture of congestion resulting in an architecture. This picture shows it that, that uh, offered at every point at least three or four confrontations with <coughs> different aspects of uh, of a certain kind of late 20th century modernity. So the, um, well, the, the programmatic uh, or the, the, the strategic uh, decisions that were um, applied to the, the, the brief are one of the most important things in this design because the, the, exactly the intermingling of uh, all these activities is something that is actually not present in the, the brief itself and it's one of the most uh, important uh, uh, design decisions um, um, of this project. Uh, then, so that's, that's the programmatic part of it. The, 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 there's also, of course, a formal part, and it is the question how this, um, this sort of uh, uh, stage for activities uh, could get an, an, uh, a used uh, form, or could, um, well, could, how does it look uh, like a building when all you have is actually a sort of uh, so-called uh, bustle of uh, uh, different activities. So um, the, the success of this image, because well, of, of this design, is that it uh, did not anchor all the activities that were present in one clear and unidimensional image, um, but in something that keeps on eluding uh, no matter what kind of interpretation you sort of project to it. So this comes, uh, or this becomes visible in the many associations uh, that this terminal by OMA has evoked since 1989. So people have compared it to a boulder smoothed by the seawater, a bollard, an oversized helmet from a spacesuit. Uh, some people have compared it uh, to an egg with a tower emerging from it, which was curiously enough also one of the first uh, logos uh, OMR um, used in 1975. It was also compared by OMR themselves uh, to the Tower of Babel turned upside down, to the Globe Tower from Coney Island, and also to this, which is, I think, the, the resemblance is quite striking, uh, this painting by Dominique Appia uh, from Le Temps des Gares, an exhibition on station, train stations in uh, Centre Pompidou from 1978. Now, again, the difference with all the other designs is that they, these are the other designs in this uh, clockwise um, Direction, Bob van Reet, Charles van den Hove, Maki, and again, Aldo Rossi. The difference with all the other designs is that <coughs> they sort of made use of imagery too, but the, the images they choose were not uh, uh, floating signifiers as the, uh, the design by, by Cole Haas was. So Aldo Rossi here grouped all kinds of analogous tower buildings on a platform. This is the Belgian architect Bob van Reet sort of referring to the uh, typical barn uh, in this so-called typical barn in this area. Uh, another Belgian architect assembled almost pop-like uh, fragments and Maki designed sort of fairy tale-like decor with a Ferris wheel and a giant origami uh, bird. This is again uh, Rossi. The design uh, <coughs> By Kohlhaas, um, 
Well, it's, it's simply different because it sort of seduces because of its strangeness and because of the useless uh, spectacle that it uh, offers in, in a form that uh, to which you cannot project any causality or uh, and not uh, even a sort of symbolic uh, order. Now, um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the reasons they situate center by Colas was herald. It was exactly because of the positive future it also seemed to present for the project of Europe. Um, not only for the continent's unification by means of transport. In 1989, this was still um, well, an, an, an important issue. But also for the uh, economic prosperity that was flowing at the time from a maritime trade and also for the potential that European citizens could enjoy uh, by, uh, by means of architectural proposals and uh, by the activities that architecture could house when uh, executed. So <clears throat> in this sense, uh, the Sea Trade Center also has an historical, political uh, dimension because it's Re represented or presented rather than represented everything that Europe could uh, optimistically stand for in, uh, at the end of the 80s. Um, and as you all know, in, uh, uh, <clears throat> this building was not executed because in 1919 and 1991 uh, the ferry company withdrew and uh, well, sort of probably quite uh, correctly so, realized that the battle against the train and, of course, also the airplane uh, could not be won and that the public transport by boat in this part of uh, Europe would, uh, well, almost become a sort of uh, uh, folkloristic uh, thing rather than a serious means of transport. Now, <clears throat> uh, for the evolution in the work of OMA, the Sea Trade Center plays, plays again an important role. You could say that it's, it is one of the most successful of all of OMA's projects, exactly because it, it succeeds in drawing attention to itself without actually meaning anything else than the activities that are happening inside of the architecture. So it is a building that certainly is a spectacle, but it would be probably rather boring without the activities taking place um, inside of it. It is also um, one of the last European designs of OMA for a very long time, in the sense that after 1989, Kohlhaas will be looking for his polemical stimulus um, mostly outside of Europe and actually all around the world. Um, so the, the hope that critics like Bekart invested in him invested in him in regards to the European continent will continue to flourish some years uh, on during the 90s. But then at the end of the 90s, you get, of course, a large amount in uh, Europe and in the Netherlands in particular, large amount of OMA clones and epigones trying to realize what Colas did, but without the critical necessity that was characteristic for the production of OMA during uh, the first decade. To conclude, uh, I will show you some photographs from the exhibition, the first decade. Uh, Photographs actually from the personal archives of the critic uh, here at Bekaert. This was the invitation card for the exhibition, showing the model for the, well, the, the model I've already shown, which is again a sort of polemical, if not, I think, bitter gesture to um, use as an. Um, at the invitation of a retrospective that is housed in Museum Boymans van Beuningen, a model of a, of a competition that was not won, that was at the time already being executed, the design by Jo Kuhne, and that was only taking place, well, a couple of meters uh, on the other side of the road. Another thing um, that is 
I think part of the somewhat sarcastic curatorial approach is, as you will see, the main devices for showing plans and models <coughs> in the exhibition are uh, steel bars, so normally used for reinforcing concrete. So the kind of steel bars that OMA would like to have used in the Netherlands, but actually hardly did uh, at that time. Um, <coughs> This is the, one of the executed buildings, uh, the Dance Theater in, uh, I think, an early version. There was a sort of um, volume, <coughs> somewhat reminiscent of the volume of the, the core of the design for the NIE, made by Petra Blaise in which there was inside of, so black curtains, and then inside of the volume were film projections, and, um, uh, well, so it was shaded um, models. So also a project for Rotterdam, and a um, project for uh, The Hague, for the City Hall. This is a design for Euro Disney in Paris, a hotel which didn't get executed. The apartment buildings, I think, in Groningen, actually more of a project of Kees Christians, but um, the Villa da Lava, which was already, the design already started in 88, so it was actually almost finished, but then because of all sorts of problems, execution got delayed. This is another um, a sports center for the Netherlands, a design that was um, also quite remarkable. It was sort of very last, you could say, very last attempt of Colas to get something realized in uh, <clears throat> the Netherlands because at the, the press conference of the exhibition, existed of two parts. So the first part was a uh, presentation of the, the exhibition, and the second part was a presentation of this design, um, which they still hoped to, to execute, but it wasn't also a design that, uh, I think it was for Rotterdam, a sports academy, which, which didn't get executed. This is already a little, I think. This is the part devoted to um, Melusenaar and uh, Parc de la Villette. So a picture uh, of the model of uh, Parc de la Villette and the model of Melusenaar, the new city um, <coughs> next to Paris. The picture that's also on the invitation for this lecture. So, thank you. Maybe it's a one remark, but it's a 
um, and or, or comments, question comments, and then maybe another one more general. You were saying the black box, which refers to the, the naive design huh, of this exhibition. I don't know, it's just so something. I have the tendency to think that the columns are almost uh, are ghost columns of the columns, so that's. Mm -hmm. the yeah. Uh, so it was like reconstructing the exhibition space that was intended, or is that too far fetched? No, I, I have to admit it only occurred to me quite recently, but um, there is certainly a an, uh, well, sort of resemblance to the design for the Netherlands Architecture Institute. But Although... If you zoom out, I mean, for, for me there's thousands of questions to ask, but I will not bore everybody else by doing that. Maybe we should come back to that tomorrow, but maybe one of your central theme seems to be about the shift which coincides to some extent with, uh, with the presentation of the first decade. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. it's probably oversimplified, but somehow that's also the argument you make to some extent. From buildings which you could say uh, don't seek for their specific personal presence, uh, well, which come then after 89, let's say, and, and the buildings before, which seem in a far more complex way, either conglomerates or to a certain extent um, based on repetition, urban intervention, uh, negotiation also to a certain extent with urban context as radical and blunt as they are. Mm. Is that, is that uh, I think that's one of the the shifts that you could uh, locate in uh, 1989 in the production of OMA, but there's also, this is of course also linked to the, to the fact that the work field of the office became global at the time. I think that's also connected to, probably connected to this, um, uh, this sort of letting go of, uh, of boring generic modernism. No, because, because in that regard, uh, we, we I mean, quite well-known story is the story of Prince Hall Part 1, Prince Hall mm -hmm. Part 2. As you show the Prince Hall, uh, it's Part 1 in version, more or less, in the small model. Prince Hall Part 1 is yeah, a set of uh, trusses, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, making a space possible, not much more than that. He loses uh, NIE competition, and Prince Hall Part 2 becomes, in a way, a tour de force of what's so possible. Still very much part of the language of the 80s. Mm -hmm. but, but very different in how he uses yeah. the language. Yeah, yeah you could uh, that well. You could say that Kunsthal, uh the second version of the Kunsthal is sort of building that's much more um, on its own, or that is a sort of uh, well, spectacle is a is a, a difficult word, but it's, it's sort of uh, sort of experience on its own. While the the first version is probably well, that's the thing that uh, Cola said at the time, it's probably unthinkable without the, the NIE in front of it. Mm -hmm. So you have a sort of... Uh, yeah, but I always found that argument a bit silly. Uh, I felt, I mean, I found you brought in a new argument, mm -hmm. which makes an argument, which rather says that he changes gear. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, he can maybe use this as a reason, but the reason is not really there. I mean, Phil Sol Part 2 is in many ways uh, a very different track on architecture where one building in all its complexity tries to represent all the other big buildings he cannot build. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or kind of almost like a model, a building is a model, yeah. which is closer to uh, feel what you suggest. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Anything else, Andrea? I'm sure you want to say something. No, I'm, I mean, I might imagine now that in the 80s, uh, the, the activity by UMA was was intended as a as a move against postmodernism. No? It is even true that after all of these years, no, it seems so so bizarre. No? This, this, um, this, um, the fact that it was um, understood like that, no, because uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, it was completely postmodern. I mean, uh, that was somehow a, a condition, no? Uh, it was simply referring to a different set of languages mm -hmm. that, I mean, just using constructivism and, and Ibersheimer and I don't know what instead of, uh, instead of uh, yeah, 
the Romans, somehow, you know? mm -hmm. or the Renaissance, or the Gothic, or whatever. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering whether already in the 80s uh, there was an explicit uh, discourse on the fact of on the fact that they were still using heavily using other languages and also now. I think that <coughs> one of the most uh, important projects in this regard is the the Airplan housing project in uh, Amsterdam, which is actually sort of collage of modernist uh, housing models. Um, but uh, one of the things that Kolas himself said about this project is that by the by the time it got executed in again I think eighty eight or eighty nine. Uh, this kind of modernism, sort of repetition of uh, modernist language, had become the, the norm uh, in uh, the Netherlands and uh, had become, well, somewhat, had completely lost its subversive uh, status. Another thing is also that, uh, that's of course a symbolical event, but in 1989 was also the year in which the Berlin Wall fell. And it was also the end of uh, some, well, the left uh, communist regimes, which sort of sort of uh, influenced the the way that, uh, for example, in the case of the air plan, the um, social housing could be could be done, or uh, actually the 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 idea of social housing somewhat uh, well disappeared from the agenda uh, during the 90s or became a completely different kind of uh, thing, certainly in the Netherlands. And that also has to do with, with sort of uh, leaving the, the, the repetition of the modernist uh, language, I think. But, but I agree with you that there is a sort of postmodern uh, technique already during the 80s of, of uh, using modernist uh, fragments, which is, of course, a very... Uh, in that regard, it's somewhat even to the point of being confusing, because we show the Bruges of Moray, mm -hmm. and then you show the, the Rossi building, you know? it could have been to a certain extent Moray, but then five years earlier, because he has this pedestal on which he puts a whole set of buildings, uh, one kind of modernist block, another one, another one, I mean, the first reference you think of is Peter's New York, uh, the city of the Catholic Grove. So if you would have not known better, and you said, is this Moray proposal, and you no, know, I think it would have been incredible. Incredible. It would be incredible position yeah. to say this is what I mean. Okay, we now know uh, Sibiu is yeah. famous. We cannot say that anymore, but it would have been close. Or we, why not? I mean, if I would ask you, well, why I think is it not an old there's still a sort of. Uh, Sort of nostalgic postcard uh, aesthetic to the the Rossi design that is maybe not present in the city of the captive globe. I think, which is actually sort of again a grid of uh, endless. Uh, only the, the picture of the city of the captive globe is only one part of an uh, sort of possibly unlimited grid, while the the design by Rossi is is a clear is something you could almost put under a a glass uh, stolop. Uh, now you're almost saying, and that may be more to the point, that uh, all my all maze architecture from the 80s was uh, circling around endlessness. I mean, you, you mentioned that in the week. You mentioned that also actually in the beginning of Frankfurt, mm -hmm. you say uh, the degrade makes it so called contained, but I would argue the inverse. I mean, it kind of represents endlessness in the most extreme sense. I mean, so simple. There's a beginning and an end that almost fades away. Um, and I mean, you, you can, all the projects you see, and even Zeebrooch, in that sense, still is very much that. He writes about it, the kind of building which is unbuildable, so you build it over three. Well, it's 50 years or so. Uh, so, so there's this uh, bizarre uh, obsession with between buildings, which in some strange way seem to escape from your hands because they're never quite containable. And, and that maybe changes, and maybe not so much in 89, but that probably changes after the Ralil is finished, and that changes mm -hmm. after the Kunsthal is finished, that changes, I don't know, somewhere in the late 90s. I don't know. Yeah, 
to probably yeah, get. Of course, has that to do. He talks about himself, the bigness. He talks about still is very much about his energy because we have no clue what's in these buildings. They're they're forever. You know, they're you never know if they're ten floors, twenty floors, or, or three. Um, but then somehow that he often talks about that film-oriented train of thoughts huh? mm -hmm. uh, somehow disappears. And the, the, the Kudar cut, I mean, since we're here, you know, yeah. the village of Kudar. I don't know. Yes, no, but I think that that idea, still that idea of endlessness or of the sort of um, buildings that seem to roll off on a factory line, as uh, to use the, the Tafuri metaphor, is uh, certainly still somewhat slowly disappears uh, during the 90s in their production, I think. Because you want to think about it, it's obvious he starts with Super Studio and Archizu. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's fascinated by that. He invites them at the AP school. Then he, he brings his own version, which is always a constructed, a very really finite version of something infinite. Uh, sorry, infinite, or yeah. let's say. And it seems to be a theme for at least 20 years. I mean, this endless uh, celebration of building something, and of course never really succeeding, no. uh, which it has no end, but somehow uh, has to have an end. So, in a way, that oxymoron to try to construct them. And somehow, I don't know, in the end of the 90s, it just totally disappears. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All of you. I think for me it's interesting to see that they, I mean, it's all from this kind of neo, afterwards we would say, sort of neo-modernistic attitude, means this kind of linear element, cutting uh, programs into smaller uh, uh, pieces and producing also sort of anti-representation. So when you see, for instance, the parliament, that he, and let's say for me personally, it would be disaster to imagine that they would build it like that. <laughs> And it's really interesting to see how in these 10 years the strategy changed and things become more and more compact. And yeah, it's also saying really yes to capitalism in a way. And, this is sort of, uh, and also the, the, in, in the beginning it's really unclear what the representation is, but I think especially with uh, German and Zed Brücke, you have really a sort of moment that it really becomes architecture in a way, as a sort of also in the traditional, in the traditional sense, a sort of traditional. Switch because mm -hmm. it's also because sometimes also parallel when you see the I think the competition for uh, La Villette I think was also in 1988 or something was already but earlier I think yeah but this is also yeah. again very fragmented but at a certain moment I mean you stop with that and then it's, it becomes this great period of the big library and mm -hmm. set guy and this kind of stuff where the way also more of the feeling that he is discovering himself, because I think in the beginning it's also very often that you have the idea is very possible, like, like Andrea said, that you can always open a book, it can say it looks a bit like Leonid, or probably it looks a bit like Niemeyer, right? mm -hmm. and then at a certain moment you don't know anymore, because the terminal and they would be not really, there's not really any kind of, or at least not so many modernistic projects, that are at least a bit similar, at least I do. So. Well, he does a discovery there, right? I mean, in Zeebrugge, he does a discovery that in order to make something endless, he does not have to make it flat and forever and fragmented. But he realized that if he makes the building big, somehow he creates within that bubble an endlessness. And that's an amazing discovery. And then he writes about it. And then he makes his buildings and never gets to you know, execute it. I mean, I mean, I find it really interesting. It's like, it's like you're looking for a wormhole or something, and all of a sudden it's there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, uh, for me, the Zeebrugge building is exactly that. It's discovering size. Yeah. Um, or the, the yeah. Trigrand Tric Bibliothèque from, was from 1990, I think. It's well, comparable. That's, that's yeah. really the next step. Yeah. There was a question from the public yeah. there. Um, it was uh, related to... The, because you talk mainly about Colas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking, is the evolution in his work is also related to the evolution with his collaborators? Because... The first decade was, if I'm right, like marked by the collaboration with Zengelis, and then Zengelis left, and also there is like different collaborator that brings probably things, and maybe you have some relation to mm -hmm. yeah. this project and this collaboration. 
<laughs> Certainly, the influence of Zangelis uh, diminished during the 80s because then uh, I don't know exactly when, but then the Wema used to have until the mid 80s a sort of office in Athens, and then there was a famous anecdote in which Colas would have said, "No, it's over. I am OMA now." So. Um, but uh, interesting in that regard is the f actually, I think it's the very first uh, design they show in their uh, objects um, or project chronology at the website is the design for the Irish Prime Minister, which was uh, at the time interpreted as a cadaver ex key, sort of you put two, two completely different elements together. and. That can be interpreted as a sort of design by Zengelis and a design by Kohlhaas as um, uh, two components. And there you see indeed somewhat different or clearly different uh, approach to um, well, to architecture. So it could be that um, that that well that, that certainly has been certainly the the the, the departure of Zengelis or the. The split, uh, I think, has, has played a role in this. It is quite true that the Zengelis actually recall well, I think, Gabilet is 82. Actually, already they were fighting in Gabilet. Uh, and Emilia says that himself. I mean, they were completely disagreeing with Gabilet. I mean, Emilia claims that they were fucked up Gabilet competition by making the new big model. That's also Cola uh, saying, I am OMA now, is also uh, probably the reason why he starts the, the project chronology in 1978, because indeed the production of the office started in 72 with uh, well, Exodus, but also other, quite a lot of, uh, I think, Sengeli's driven um, projects. Hey guys, do we round up or is there a virgin font? No? Okay, yeah, it's more uh, as a landscape architect, the hypothesis that I would like to put forward is what's interesting is when, when he does his buildings like the, the Den Haag City Hall, mm -hmm. it's, it's always showing the object of what is building. While in the Bruges, suddenly you have this kind of seascape and you're looking out, out of the building. Is, is, this, is this by accident or is there a kind of shift in, in trying to incorporate the, the kind of environment outside of the building as um, a main feature of the building, the, the, the view on the, the ocean. Mm. Um, while in the other, the, the early works, it always seems to be looking at the building, not looking outside of it. No, you don't, yeah. It's true that you don't have that much uh, views from inside to the outside. But I think in the, 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 the drawings for uh, Zee Bruges, well, show the ocean, but that is sort of empty, well, it's the ocean, but there's a, he wanted to make in his buildings. Yeah, but it's also well the largest part or the most important part of the picture is still the the landscape inside of the building and the the extreme uh, well sort of endlessness of activities and uh, and spaces inside of the building itself. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christophe, especially. Uh, I also wanted to thank the people here in front who are partly our guests uh, tomorrow morning still. So, David, uh, who's already here, David von Seven, uh, and uh, Bas Smets, who will be there in the morning also, uh, together with Eric Sapia, who will come also uh, for, the, for the jury in the term. Um, so, uh, thank you, Arno, for Arno uh, Biar of Transolar, by the way. Stay here with us. <laughs> I hope it was not too boring. <laughs> uh, but we very much enjoyed it, Christoph. Um, and uh, we, I would like to still say, I think at 8.30 tomorrow morning, starts the jury. Thanks, guys.